good afternoon. On behalf of uh, the Communicable Disease Subcommittee of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, Ceylon College of Physicians, Ceylon College of Internal Medicines, I welcome you for this uh, discussion on update on typhoid. The reason we thought of organizing this uh, today is that uh, over the last six to eight weeks, we have noticed an upsurge of cases of typhoid fever uh, among our patients in various parts of the country. Therefore, we thought it is quite prudent to uh, have a discussion on this to update the knowledge of all of us uh, on this issue uh, since it is a communicable disease as we all know and also with this uh, uh, migration happening during the holiday period, new year period uh, with also with uh, people, more people eating out, there's a high risk of more cases coming uh, within next couple of weeks. Today, uh, we are fortunate to have resource people, uh, Dr. Malika uh, from uh, President Ceylon uh, Sri Lanka College of uh, Microbiologists, uh, uh, Kosala Karnaratna, President uh, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Satish Chandra, uh, former president of the Sri Lanka uh, College of Internal Medicine with us to discuss on this important issue. And also uh, Dr. Sujata Patirage, consultant microbiologist of the Medical Research Institute, Colombo. Uh, to start this uh, discussion, may I invite uh, Dr. Sujata Patirage uh, to give us an overview of the salmonella infection and typhoid fever in Sri Lanka. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Now, uh, uh, we recently, uh, as uh, Dr. Vijayvikram mentioned, now we recently noticed an uh, increased number of uh, typhoid cases or the patients uh, with typhoid fever. Uh, in various part of the country. Uh, so this is, uh, as I think it is not uh, unfamiliar to us, uh, typhoid fever, but just to mention, uh, this is uh, uh, Salmonella uh, typhi is the main, uh, the, is the pathogen which causes typhoid fever. And uh, but there is a like when we talk about enteric fever that uh, covers Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi A B C, uh, all four organisms are responsible for enteric fever, and uh, out of them like uh, but Salmonella itself is a vast uh, group of organisms belongs to Enterobacteriaceae, and uh, uh, this. Uh, you can see uh, how the salmonella species are uh, divided and out of all the pathogens uh, uh, who are responsible for uh, salmonellosis in human includes uh, like uh, there are two categories. One is typhoidal salmonella and non-typhoidal salmonella. Now today uh, we are more focused on the uh, out of the typhoidal salmonella, the uh, salmonella typhi, which is responsible for typhoid fever. That is what we have seen recently. Uh, and in, uh, the important thing is now this salmonella typhi is an uh, organism which is restricted to human, and uh, but it can survive in uh, environment. 
uh, it will support the transmission and persistence of this organism in the environment. But of course, they are the they have limited capacity to multi uh, multiply outside the human host. Uh, but there aren't. We have to understand that there aren't any animal reservoirs for Salmonella typhi because uh, sometimes we might uh, think that uh, this is coming from egg, uh, poultry, uh, so many things. But uh, it is the non non human animal reservoirs are not uh, responsible for. Uh, this uh, typhoid fever, unless food and water uh, behave as a vehicle of transmission of this pathogen. But it is different from other salmonellosis, non-typhoid salmonella, which is mainly uh, coming from the uh, food and there is a uh, large uh, animal reservoir for that pathogen and it is a zoonosis. So just to mention how this salmonella is, now it has a, like a, what we talk about somatic antigen, uh, flagella antigen and the VI antigen. Uh, these are the uh, antigen which we, uh, against these antigen, uh, when we, certain instances, when we talk about antibodies against salmonella typhi, we consider this uh, uh, an antibody against these uh, antigens. So if I just uh, show you a little bit data on this current outbreak, uh, our, our, the count, we may not say outbreak, but there is increased number of cases. Um, this is now, this uh, graph shows since 2019, uh, that we had uh, uh, salmonella typhi from various parts of the country. And Jaffna was the leading district uh, since 2019 to 2022. And even in 2022, uh, we had about nearly uh, 39 cases, uh, typhoid fever reported to the, these are laboratory data actually. And I, uh, this, is, this does not represent Sri Lanka. And these are the like, uh, it based on the how many uh, laboratories which did not have facilities to identify salmonella typhi and sent to uh, entric reference laboratory MRI. However, the uh, based on the data, the Jaffna was the uh, district which had higher number of uh, isolates. But in 2023 uh, onwards, it's turned, uh, different. And Colombo had a uh, higher number of cases in 2023. Uh, but surprisingly, in 2024, uh, within this three uh, months period, but even then it is uh, mid-February to uh, up to now, we had uh, 23 cases from Colombo district. And uh, we haven't received any uh, reported cases from Jaffna. So this is the current situation uh, on typhoid. Uh, uh, the I think uh, the what we uh, really what we have noticed during this year will be discussed. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijayvikrama and the SLMA for uh, giving us this opportunity to have this symposium on typhoid, which is a very timely uh, symposium. Now, I'm going to present just a few, uh, one, slide, one or two slides about uh, what we have found these days as microbiologists. Um, actually, um, when the uh, whistle was blown about this um, rising typhoid fever cases, actually the laboratory confirmed uh, isolates. Uh, we have noticed that uh, certain microbiologists have informed us that uh, even in NIID where I worked, we have seen uh, several cases of typhoid. So we thought we would uh, uh, collect uh, data just to see whether this is an actual rise. So uh, quickly, uh, we have uh, developed a Google sheet and started to collect data. So here now, before uh, showing that, uh, actually, I want to show this. Now, this is uh, the, I got this from the sources, uh, a weekly epidemiological report. This is available in uh, on the web, uh, the epidemiology web website. So here you can see 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 cases. Now, enteric fever cases up to first week of uh, April. The total number you can see in 2018, it was uh, uh, 116. You don't have a. We uh, have one. That's okay. Yeah. And uh, 2019, it's 80, 2058, 20, 2021, 28, and 2022, 45. And last year, it was 18 up to this week of the year. And total cases, you can see um, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, there, there was a decline in total number of cases towards the, uh, uh, this part of the year because uh, I think uh, they have there may be several reasons during COVID. I don't know whether the, the, the notification may not be uh, same or uh, they are, uh, the, when I just inquired from the epidemic, they say they have implemented the uh, vaccination program as well for the food handlers. So there may be several reasons. How, but Anyhow, we know that uh, Sri Lanka is an endemic country for uh, typhoid. Um, so our data, if I just show you, this is now up to now. Uh, we have started collecting data from mid-February, uh, 15th of February. So up to now, we are having 44 cases and there are several other few cases to be confirmed by the laboratories uh, in MRI. And uh, Salmonella typhi blood isolates 43, stool 1. And uh, uh, females are more in this case. And uh, age distribution is like this, mainly uh, children. Uh, so that is uh, uh, the case of uh, worldwide. Uh, it's like that. And uh, so these are the laboratories who detected the uh, typhi cases. Uh, you can see uh, Colombo district. This is the laboratory wise. But when we just um, collect the data regarding uh, they are, uh, the abode in places, travel history and all, majority uh, of patients were from Colombo and Kalatar districts. So here you can see, although we have collected data, started to collect data from mid-February, actually uh, the peak is around uh, mid-March. So still we are finding cases, but after 3rd April, uh, there are no laboratory confirmed cases. However, now, uh, although the although there are only 45 laboratory confirmed, 45 odd laboratory confirmed cases, there may be, the true number may be much more higher than this because uh, sus this is not the true notification figures. So suspected cases, clinically confirmed, not laboratory confirmed cases may be they are uh, much more higher. So uh, presenting complaints, if we just collected this, you can see mainly acute fevers, abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea. This, I'm talking about this current uh, rise of fevers, uh, whatever the outbreak, uh, diarrhea, then headache, constipation, vomiting, and there were 
two cases of ileal perforation up to now uh, reported to us. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujata Patrega and Dr. Malika Karnavna for that uh, uh, overview of uh, the historical overview and the present situation of uh, typhoid uh, in the country. Uh, may I ask Dr. Kosal Karnavna, the consultant pediatrician, about the presentation in a pediatric population because in children it is a very important uh, illness and worldwide I believe it is the children who suffer from this mostly. Uh, could you tell us about the uh, the situation of uh, Sri Lanka with related to pediatric uh, illness and also their presentations? Uh, course, uh, thank you very much, Ananda. And first uh, and foremost, I must uh, thank Sri Lanka uh, SLMA for giving this opportunity to me to talk about typhoid. Uh, actually, I have a little bit of experience in typhoid because I have worked in Putlam district for the for seven years in my career and now at LRH uh, also I have seen several cases of typhoid but we saw uh, more typhoid cases this year in Lady Ridge Hospital that uh, drew our attention to it. We saw six cases of culture proven uh, typhoid in this year and all these children were above five years and most of them were transferred uh, and they were all from Kalutara district. One was from Piliandala, but uh, adjacent to Kalutara district. And all of them had high fever. The fever pattern as described classically in books is a step ladder rise. Again, step ladder rise is not very common uh, presentation in children. They get more abrupt fevers and as pyrexia of unknown origin. Uh, again, all these children didn't have the step ladder rise in temperature. They had uh, high grade intermittent fevers. And uh, what is interesting to know is they had, uh, they didn't have many other symptoms, but some of them had about one or two had uh, loose stools. Again, loose stools alternating with constipation is not a common pattern in children, like unlike in adults. None of the children had uh, constipation. And the uh, the important thing is some of the children had respiratory symptoms. They can have dry cough. So one or two of the children had gone to GPs and treated with varying antibiotics, probably altering the fever pattern classically described in typhoid. So they may first go to the GP and that may contribute to antibiotic resistance as well. So what was alarming was one of the children got typhoid uh, perforation. And I have a slide of that uh, child uh, in the uh, OT what was taken I can show you that so this this child was transferred uh, to us uh, yeah okay so this child so we'll talk a little bit about this child's presentation a little bit later so this was uh, the uh, typhoid perforation is a extreme uh, complication of typhoid so so again uh, so this shows the importance of uh, uh, addressing to this issue in our country because a child getting perforation is a rare occurrence. And uh, I'll go a little bit into the symptoms of some of the children. Uh, the, 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 the ch this child's brother was admitted to my ward. Again, with a high-grade fever, culture was negative. But the child had typical some of the typical signs of typhoid. So, so, so typhoid is a disease, is a primary clinical diagnosis. So with the Fever, this particular child had the soft, uh, what the pathologist described as a defluent spleen. It's very soft spleen and dovey abdomen. So responded very well to keftraxone. 
So again, a little bit about uh, the antibiotics. Uh, uh, the kefraxon is the drug of choice we used in all the children and responded well. But what we noticed of the transfers was that uh, kefraxon had been started clinically suspecting typhoid, but it was upgraded very fast. So that's the point I want to emphasize because now in typhoid, uh, after starting antibiotics, it takes about five to seven days for the fever to settle. Clinically, they get better. So you have to be a little bit uh, tolerant to that and allow the fever to calm down. So the, 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 these children were upgraded to merapenem, amikacin, which are not very effective in typhoid. So a good back of ketraxon is the drug of choice. And the complicated child also had quick upgrades. So again, that point I want to make. And the science-wise in children, again, like in adults, you can get Dovi abdomen, soft spleen. I have noticed that firm liver is also a feature in children rather than a soft liver. And coated tongue, not very common. And some of these uh, physical signs are identical like in adults. But again, neutropenia and some of the laboratory criteria are not common in children. So I think that's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gosala. We'll go into more details uh, later. Uh, now, out of the 44 laboratory confirmed cases, uh, 27 are adults. Uh, even though generally we, we uh, historically it is said that childhood illness, but we are, this time we see significant proportion of uh, adult as well. And also it is important to keep in mind that uh, these are the confirmed cases. So there has to be much more or cases which were clinically uh, treated. Uh, now, may I uh, ask uh, Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra about the adult presentation? Is it is it the same we learned in uh, our medical school uh, described in textbook, or is it different? And uh, what are the presentations uh, we are seeing at the moment? Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. thank you, Ananda, and uh, thank you, SLMA, for giving me the opportunity to. Uh, uh, give a few thoughts on the uh, recent rise in typhoid cases and the presentation and management in adults. Uh, uh, I must say that there have been a few cases detected at National Hospital where I work. Uh, actually, one, to my knowledge, was culture positive. Uh, it was a proven case of uh, typhoid. And there were a few others as well. And there were quite a few uh, uh, clinical cases which were uh, uh, cases which were treated as for typhoid. Um, one important thing to remember in the adult presentation is that the symptoms depend on the time of presentation. So classically, we say typhoid has an incubation period of, of about a week or two, so 7 to 14 days. So after which the symptoms come on. And depending on the, on the stage of the illness, the symptoms can be different. So it's very important as a clinician to appreciate, uh, take a good history and find out exactly how many days of uh, fever or uh, symptoms have been there when assessing a patient. So we say classically that in the first week of the illness, uh, the patient gets fever, headache, can be a dull frontal headache, malaise, and progressively the fever increases. As Kosala said, we don't actually see the step ladder increase in fever in adults as well, but uh, there can be a progressive increase in the fever. And um, with that, they may complain of other symptoms like malaise and body aches. And there may be abdominal symptoms even in the first week. So they can have uh, abdominal pain, uh, especially in the right upper quadrant. And uh, there may be some early distension as well, but generally some abdominal symptoms and they could have uh, constipation or diarrhea. Now, um, now, the basis for constipation is that uh, there is said to be inflammation in the uh, pear patches in the in the in the bowel, so which will uh, uh, narrow the bowel lumen, and which in turn could cause constipation. But this is not always seen. So there, is, in some patients, we see diarrhea, especially in patients who are immunocompromised. And even about in about one third of patients, there may be diarrhea, even in adults. I think diarrhea probably is a is a more uh, commonly seen symptom in in the in the pediatric age group. And uh, as the illness progresses, if the illness is not treated, if in the second week of the illness, the fever goes up. So by about the 10th day, the fever may be 103, 104 Fahrenheit. 
and the patient looks quite ill. And at that stage, you may see a soft, soft uh, spleen. There may be abdominal pain and tenderness, and a soft uh, spleen may be seen. Uh, and you could see the patient he, is quite ill. And by now, of course, with, the, with our initial investigations, uh, we would come to a clinical diagnosis of uh, typhoid, and most cases are treated. So it's important uh, in the initial stages, there are other DDs which we should exclude, like dengue um, and even viral hepatitis. But as the illness progresses, I think it becomes obvious that it's a bacterial in infection, which is uh, causing uh, uh, quite a severe illness. Um, and uh, so blood tests may be helpful, uh, but they will give a clue. So if you take the full blood count, there will be, initially there may even be a, uh, 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 be a relative neutropenia, uh, 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 relative uh, lymphopenia. But uh, as, as the illness goes on, the lymphocyte count may increase. And uh, classically, the CRP, ESR will increase. And in a patient who presents with fever without respiratory symptoms and without the features of dengue, if you see a high CRP, high ESR, and symptoms and signs compatible with typhoid, I think it's a, it, that's a good enough clinical scenario to diagnose typhoid on clinical grounds and start treatment. Because it's important because as if you initiate early treatment, the complications are less and patients get better soon. So it's important that we make a clinical diagnosis. Of course, as I said, it's a clinical diagnosis. Of course, in the first week, we send off all the cultures when the patients come. So most importantly, blood cultures. Uh, stool cultures, urine culture as well. And the uh, stool culture and blood culture may become positive, uh, but uh, the cultures will take some time and then if in the appropriate clinical setting, treatment is initiated. If the illness is not diagnosed and the patient continues to have fever uh, after the second week, uh, then the patient becomes toxic. The patient will be very ill uh, there will be uh, even a uh, drop in uh, GCS. The patient will become confused. Uh, we uh, speak classically of obtundation, stupor, coma. So even those symptoms can come on. Uh, but those are not, not usually we don't see them because we, we initiate treatment quite soon unless the patient presents late, in which case uh, we have to use our clinical judgment and wonder whether this is a case of typhoid. And of course, uh, the management, uh, classically, as uh, Kosala said, the drug of choice is IV ketraxone. So uh, we give that on an empiric basis uh, until the cultures arrive. One other important point in adults that I have to stress is that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, migration these days. And we see lots of patients from the South, uh, South Asian region, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lankans who've gone there and come back, and also uh, uh, nationals in those countries who come back. And typhoid is rampant in those countries and they have drug-resistant typhoid. They have especially this variety called XDR, uh, extremely drug-resistant typhoid. I think there was an outbreak in Pakistan in 2016 and there were quite a few cases which were resistant to ketraxone. So the importance of doing the cultures is that if we do the cultures, we will get to know exactly what uh, bacteria has, what salmonella uh, type has uh, uh, type has caused it, as well as the ABSD. So I think uh, I can't uh, uh, stress uh, enough on the need for cultures uh, because those drug resistant uh, cases will not be uh, will not be covered by ketraxone. Then we'll have to give carbapenems or azithromycin or tigacycline. So those are uh, quite advanced drugs. And uh, we see lots of Pakistani and Indian patients on our medical wards now. So I think it's important that we think of typhoid as a differential diagnosis and uh, treat those and, of course, get the cultures. Um, so complications, of course, if we leave the case patients untreated, we know of the, uh, of the dreaded complications, mainly the bowel complications. The patients can develop uh, intestinal hemorrhage and they can have intestinal uh, perforation as well. One important thing is that sometimes, classically the patients will have uh, signs of peritonitis with uh, uh, guarding rigidity, uh, but some may not have, about 25% of patients may not have any of those signs, but they will have ascites. So ascites is in adults. If there's ascites, that's a 
uh, that's an alarming symptom in a patient, alarming sign in a patient who has presented with typhoid fever. So that may indicate perforation and you should do the appropriate investigations, get the surgical team to have a look and see whether there is uh, any uh, perforation involved. They can also have lots of uh, neuropsych, new, new, neurological complications. There can be an aseptic meningitis, there can be even a, a leukoencephalopathy where the patient becomes quite uh, drowsy. Uh, and there can there have been uh, cases of uh, uh, abscess formation as well. So those are those are not those are quite rare. And as Kosala said, uh, dry cough can also be a symptom. And some there may be instances when patients develop frank lower pneumonia. So even that is described rarely. And of course, there can be other complications like uh, polycystitis, cholangitis, there can be pa uh, pancreatitis. So those are all, they, they all happen in the third, second or latter part of the second week or the third week of the illness. Now, if you leave a patient of a patient with typhoid untreated, 15% will die. So others may recover, but they may have chronic sequelae as well. And one other thing about typhoid is that there can be uh, relapses. So rarely, uh, about 5% of cases can relapse. So they may present, they may improve, go home, come back again with symptoms. And in that case, you have to go through the same routine, do the cultures, try to identify the pathogen. And of course, in some patients, there is this uh, situation of chronic carrier state where the, the patients improve, but they continue to excrete uh, salmonella in their uh, feces and urine especially in the feces, and those are the patients who, uh, uh, people who, if they are food handlers, who could sort of uh, give the infection around. So it's important to uh, uh, identify those carriers by doing tool cultures. Of course, it's practically quite difficult, but at least in, patient, in people who have associated with uh, proven patients with typhoid, I think that's an important thing to do. Uh, the, the chronic carrier state is defined as somebody having a positive stool culture more than for more than one year. So that's uh, uh, those patients are rare, but uh, there are patients. So uh, in the adult spectrum, so there's a clinical spectrum. So uh, the, the most important thing is in the assessment to assess the patient according to the stage of the illness. That's number one. And number two is to make a clinical diagnosis and initiate the appropriate treatment. And of course, look out for drug resistant typhoid because that's going to become a uh, become an uh, emerging problem. Thank you, Harsha. Uh, as uh, you pointed out quite rightly, uh, we have to clinically suspect this and take a pro do appropriate investigations and appro start on appropriate antibiotics. Now, uh, the confirmation, as we all know, is done by cultures. Uh, when should we do these cultures, the blood cultures, tools cultures, when should we think of typhoid and do these cultures? Malika? Yes, uh, when we are talking about cultures, actually I want to uh, add one point, but uh, to what uh, Saki said, now regarding um, the, the uh, perforation, actually he quite rightly mentioned that uh, some people, some patients, they don't get much uh, signs of abdominal uh, the rigidity guarding, uh, tenderness, those things. So, but uh, now generally the, these patients, they have uh, uh, leukopenia initially, but during towards uh, third week, uh, second week, third week, if they develop leukocytosis, that is also, uh, we have to, one thing that we need to suspect is uh, perforation. That is a very known thing. So regarding cultures, actually, uh, um, now, any patient with fever, if you are starting antibiotics, if you think of starting antibiotics, the rule is to take a blood culture. So here also, the same, uh, we have to take blood cultures. Uh, now, uh, when we just think of uh, the typhoid, uh, uh, the pathogenesis of salmonella typhi, uh, after entering through the intestine, uh, they multiply in the lymphoid system and uh, enter into the bloodstream. Uh, that is uh, actually a very uh, mild bacteremia. Uh, we call it as primary bacteremia. During that time, blood cultures may not be positive. But after that, um, main organs 
will get uh, affected like liver, spleen, bone marrow. This organism will multiply there. And a large number of organisms will be released into the bloodstream. That is the time that we need to take blood. That is generally uh, within one week of the after, no, soon after one week, five after five days, of course, if you just think of taking blood cultures, that should be positive uh, before starting antibiotics. Uh, but you should not delay starting treatment until you get the confirmation. We can take the blood cultures and start antibiotics. Stool cultures, of course, uh, when we start uh, at the beginning also, there may be organisms because it is multiplying the intestine, the terminal ileum. But uh, now during primary bacteremia um, uh, and secondary bacteremia, the gallbladder will get affected and organisms will be multiplied in the gallbladder and uh, organisms will re-enter the uh, intestine. At that time, uh, we will be able to find uh, so, uh, organisms in the stool as well and urine. Uh, if the bladder is affected, it is positive in the urine also. So uh, the, the, the most important uh, the message I want to pass to you is uh, please take blood cultures for each and every patient. If you are suspecting, if you want to start antibiotics um, and uh, now for like now if you are uh, thinking of starting, uh, if you are thinking of urinary tract infection, no need to take blood cultures. Uh, clinically, you can assess the patient, but still uh, uh, with fever and suspected cases of typhoid, yes, blood culture should be uh, taken. Yes. Uh, uh, the, this fifth day of illness or fifth day of the fever, the, the blood culture should be taken as soon as possible? Uh, yes. No, as the, soon yeah, uh, now... Fever means it is uh, bacteremia is there. Now, before that, patient will get some insidious uh, symptoms. So during that period, blood cultures may not be positive. But if you are starting antibiotics, whatever the time you have to take blood culture in suspected cases. Now, uh, some hospitals may not have the facility to identify the salmon and typhi properly. Uh, the, due to the limited uh, resources available. So when should they send these to MRI? And and uh, if they cannot identify you, how can they suspect it from blood cultures? That is uh, one question I would li I like to uh, ask from uh, Dr. Sujata. And also, Sujata, uh, another test we have been traditionally doing was the VIDA test. How useful it is in the, in the present context. Uh, actually, now, uh, uh, blood culture isolates. Now, once we do a blood culture, there are uh, certain procedures we carry out in the laboratory where we use culture media, where uh, blood dega and the Mekong Kega. So that in the laboratory person, in the laboratory, they can, uh, looking at the culture plates, they can, uh, using certain biochemical tests, you can, they can... Uh, suspect possibility of uh, uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria and there are certain other supportive tests. Uh, and if they suspect based on those uh, biochemical and the culture media, they can, if they don't have, now confirmation is done by doing uh, sero serotyping of uh, these uh, bacteria. So if they don't have antisera to serotype, they can send the isolate to uh, MRI. MRI can do the serotyping. Uh, at the moment, uh, that is uh, now due to the unavailability of antisera, the most of the isolates are sent to MRI. Uh, then uh, regarding, yeah, regarding Vidal test, uh, Vidal test uh, where uh, it was uh, based on the antibody against the antigen O, H, and V, I. Uh, but in endemic countries like ours, uh, there can be false positivity. Uh, 
uh, and there can be cross reactions. <laughs> so this is non-specific and uh, unless it may be helpful if your clinical is suspect in typhoid and then the uh, Vidal test is positive, that may be just a clue, but it is not a very good uh, test to be uh, gone by because I have seen uh, page, uh, people who are like uh, now some places they are doing uh, Vidal test to trace uh, food handlers uh, to see whether they had uh, typhoid. But we have seen a lot of uh, cases with very high teeters, but uh, they don't give a, even a reason to uh, the past history of uh, even a fever. So we can't go by uh, Vidalitis for the diagnosis. Yeah, and also uh, this uh, Vidalitis, just to add what Sujata is uh, talking about, uh, Vidalitis, if at all, if it is... Uh, uh, if you want to consider it as a, a good uh, uh, diagnostic test, you have to see a rising teeter. If there is a rising teeter, then uh, we can just come to a certain extent. We can come to it because, uh, and also both O and H should be positive. No, yes, because H uh, antibody that comes first and it goes off first within six months, it will go off. Uh, H antibody will be there for some time and there is an, an anamnestic crisis also there with the H antibody. That means it, uh, the infections that H can go up uh, due to the uh, prostate activity. So therefore, we have to be very careful if you are uh, giving uh, any clinical diagnosis depending on the Vidal test. Uh, actually, the if there is a, a fourfold rise, then of course, you can just take it as a, this thing. And also regarding the cultures, I have forgotten to tell you that uh, even uh, these rose spots cultures also uh, if you just uh, take cultures that maybe could be positive and skin yes uh, abdominal very rarely you will see the <laughs> rose spots and also uh, the bone marrow cultures uh, the one advantage of bone marrow culture is even if you have started antibiotics the organisms uh, will be there, remaining there for some time, for a few days. Uh, in the uh, So bone marrow, the high chance of getting positivity in bone marrow cultures. Uh, thank you, Manika. Uh, so uh, so basically the Vidal test doesn't have much place. If you are doing, you have to do two kind of, two uh, test to see a rise in theta, but that will be two weeks apart, isn't it? Yeah, two weeks apart. So, unless it is a patient with the pyrexia of unknown origin, it's not going to be of much use. Uh, and uh, then there was a question asked online about the about the blood cultures, doing uh, doing blood cultures in the private sector, saying that the patients, uh, the patients don't like it much to get the blood culture done because of the high cost. It, it uh, costs about 10,000, the question says. Uh, but I think what is important to uh, um, uh, tell the patient is that if it is typhoid and if it is otherwise, if the fever continues, the changing antibiotics, that will co cause much more than getting a blood culture done. So doing a blood culture, especially if you are going to start a patient on IV antibiotics, is extremely important uh, so that we know the diagnosis and the sensitivity pattern. Uh, now, other than uh, now, when, when should we think of uh, starting uh, uh, IV keftriaxone? It is it has been told by both Kosal and uh, Arsha that uh, it is the drug of choice is keftriaxone. Uh, so, when should we think of starting keftriaxone? And in addition to that, what other management measures should be taken in the these patients? Kosal uh, first, and then. So the answer to that is uh, depends on the severity. Uh, now, if, uh, if I talk about children, uh, if, if a child comes with clinical typhoid with high fever, I would definitely go for IV on after taking blood culture. And but uh, it is described that in milder cases you can start with oral antibiotics like amoxicillin, cefixime, and ciprofloxacin. 
uh, but yes, I would uh, say that if you clinically suspect activity. typhoid uh, straight away, going to uh, uh, cultures will be uh, better in children. I wonder what Satish also will say. And regarding the rest of the general management in children, again, uh, you have to the fever in uh, typhoid is uh, like Satish said, uh, they have. Uh, sensorium changes. So, so like, unlike in viral fevers, viral fevers you get high fever going on, but in between high fevers the child is well. But here is a situation if you see the child unwell, again suspect typhoid or something more sinister like meningitis. Uh, and and also the general measures like uh, general nutrition, hydration, and antipyretics that part that should be done. And I wonder what your opinion is regarding oral and uh, Yes, uh, Madam okay. asked about chlorophenicol. I have been using chlorophenicol in the past when I was in Putnam district, and it's a very effective drug for typhoid. But the problem is uh, uh, idiosyncratic reaction uh, that affects the bone marrow. It causes a plastic anemia. And there are several lawsuits in India Again, several pediatricians uh, using cold chlorophenicol. So again, our practice also has changed, not using chlorophenicol as a first line drug. Yes, as uh, Kosa said, even in the adult population, when they present to uh, wards with uh, high fever, uh, I think uh, clinically it is uh, uh, appropriate to uh, send off the cultures and start the patient on IV ketraxone if there's a high degree of clinical suspicion of typhoid based on the recurrent presentation plus a high CRP. Uh, initially, of course, there may be uh, leukopenia uh, and uh, there can be even slight transaminase elevations as well. Uh, so in that background, uh, with the appropriate symptoms, I think it's best to start on IV ketraxone. Now, once you start the patient on ketraxone, I think you probably need about three, four days of the of the antibiotic to see a definite improvement. It patient may feel better after about uh, after a couple of days, but uh, the fever takes a little longer to come down. So you should not be uh, uh, hasty to change the antibiotic, and of course by then you will. Get the cultures as well even if the cultures are negative and if the patient is clinically improving then you can continue the ketraxone um, we don't use oral drugs in that situation as as Kosala said the other important management aspect is to detect complications so uh, it's very rare for patients to develop uh, complications when if they are started on IV ketraxone, uh, IV antibiotics early. And it's important that we start them early if we have a firm clinical diagnosis because that will prevent complications later. So that's one. So watchful waiting is probably not a good idea in that situation. So you should start. And uh, uh, once we start, of course, then assess them for complications. So uh, abdominal complications are the commonest and uh, abdominal pain could be the first sign of uh, uh, impending uh, intestinal hemorrhage or bowel per perforation. So it's important to uh, to screen patients, look for CITs, any free fluid in tummy. And uh, as uh, uh, Malika said, when there is uh, perforation, uh, there will be uh, necrosis in the bowel, which will raise the visceral count. There will be a neutrophil leukocytosis. And uh, of course, it can even, uh, patients can, as uh, I think it was told to me by uh, uh, the patients can even develop a, uh, develop complications like HLH. So it's important that uh, we we uh, uh, keep a close eye on these patients with daily assessment of their clinical status and uh, uh, manage accordingly. Now we know that typhoid uh, can become resistant to antibiotics. In the present outbreak, what is the antibiotic sensitivity pattern which is shown uh, in the laboratory? Well, that will guide us, give us a guidance uh, of what antibiotics to start on these patients. Uh, if I just brief you a little bit about the sensitivity of uh, typhoid uh, salmonella typhi, generally we say now uh, the ampicillin. Um, 
cotrimoxole and chloramphenicol. Those antibiotics, if uh, uh, isolate is resistant to those antibiotics, we call it as multidrug resistant. Uh, but if it is resistant to uh, uh, ceftriaxone and uh, uh, ciprofloxine, then we call it as uh, XDL, extended uh, drug resistant. So uh, luckily, this isolate, the, the current outbreak, the isolates we have found are uh, sensitive to even ampicillin, cotrimoxole, keftraxone, um, uh, yeah, all the all the, uh, the uh, antibiotics we tested, but it is not sensitive to ciprofloxacin. So um, now ampicillin, I think we can't find ampicillin in words. We, we, it's not available. Huh? You have ampicillin. We are pediatric words. All ah, right. In uh, adult words, uh, we, 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 we don't have, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. 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 So then uh, we can actually, uh, we can recommend to start uh, um, uh, keptraxone empirically in these patients. But uh, at the same time, I have you know, I should say uh, we should not start ciprofloxacin as empirical therapy. And once you get the uh, sensitivity pattern and if the isolate is sensitive, if you want to send the patient uh, home, then you can. But uh, don't. Uh, we don't recommend uh, starting Cipro as empirical treatment during this outbreak. Uh, Keptraxone is a, um, a good uh, option. Another important thing, uh, thing which was highlighted by many is that the, it takes time for the fever to settle with antibiotics in typhoid fever. Uh, we see sometimes changing of these antibiotics, especially in the private sector, sometimes every other day, like the fever doesn't settle. But in this situation, the fever can take maybe even five to seven days. However, the patients clinically will become will become better after two to three days with the antibiotics. Now, if we find one patient, what should be the measures taken by the other family members in that patient's family? <laughs> As I mentioned initially, the salmonella type is a like human restricted organism, and it is excreted in the uh, gut. Even after treatment, they become either a convalescent carrier, temporary carrier, or the chronic carrier. So they, this patient uh, now chronic carriers roughly about two to five percent of patient may turn into chronic carriers. Uh, so the when there is a carrier, so there is a chance that uh, uh, through the hand, the as uh, a contamination through the uh, carrier's hand, uh, it can transmit to food items, any other object, and then hand-to-hand -hand transmission, contact transmission can occur. So it's very important at the household level uh, to practice hand hygiene uh, especially when they are using uh, toilets, they should practice hand hygiene. And if they are preparing uh, food, it is important to keep the nails cut and wash the hands. And uh, yeah, if it is uh, like uh, if to prevent transmission from the particular person, is that is the basic uh, transmission precaution we can take. But in addition, now in this type of outbreak, uh, we don't know where it is coming from. So it's important like uh, uh, the epidemiology unit can get involved and they should look into the possible, I think even currently they are doing that, uh, going behind patients and their uh, eating places, whether they can uh, find out whether there is a possible source. Uh, but oh. in typhoid, it is not that easy because now patients themselves can be uh, a source. Food uh, handler-wise, of course, it is very important. Like uh, as a whole, when there is a increased number of cases, uh, it is better to uh, 
uh, improve the hygienic practices at food handler level and uh, water sources has to be uh, looked into. It may be contaminated water, so they should uh, uh, make uh, make sure that water sources are uh, good water sources for preparation of food. And the uh, whole food should be washed uh, thoroughly to remove whatever the contaminant because now in a rainy season there can be uh, green leaves and things can be contaminated with the uh, water in the, uh, in, uh, water coming from environment. In addition to patient, the, there are a lot of other measures has to be taken for prevention. In addition, uh, the, there is a food handle vaccination program in the country. Uh, now, it is done by the epidemiology unit uh, through uh, they have uh, selected now mainly the food handler vaccination is done. Uh, we are yeah uh, high risk uh, category, especially canteens, uh, in the mass scale food preparation preparation areas, and uh, along the along the like uh, during the season, they are targeting most of the places where the. Uh, long distance buses stop for meals. So those are the places they are targeting with the limited number of vaccines available. Yeah. Sorry? How long does it take for the vaccine to be effective? I think it's about uh, long. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> One week before, because the question was how long the vaccine take, uh, uh, how, how fast the vaccine acts. Uh, so vaccine seems to be acting quite fast. So it is probably one week or two we see the effect of that, but the effect is short lasting. That was the answer. Now what is uh, in the screen is the uh, the perforated bowel of a uh, pediatric patient. Can you briefly tell about the patient, uh, Kosa? Uh, yeah, this is a child who was transferred to us uh, to the surgical ward with uh, features of uh, peritonitis acute abdomen. Uh, just want to make a few points actually. So, this is again, but just to emphasize a few points. This child uh, had presented to the local hospital with high grade fever. And uh, blood culture has grown E. coli. So quite rightly, I mean, the child was initially started on Kiftraxone, but quickly upgraded to other antibiotics uh, because it showed the sensitivity pattern like that. Again, Kiftraxone was sensitive. So uh, the, again, the point I like, would like to make is uh, in typhoid, uh, giving Kiftraxone, the fever won't come down in, in crisis, like in pneumonia. So it will come down in a uh, uh, gradual manner uh, in five to seven days. So uh, this particular child, after being transferred, the blood culture grew, grew uh, salmonella. And the ulcer was typical uh, anti-mesentric body, as you can see, uh, affecting the pears patches. Uh, so it was a typical case. Uh, and also regarding vaccination, when it comes to vaccination, children are always... Uh, important in vaccinations. So there are two types of vaccines, the polysaccharide uh, vaccine and uh, uh, O antigen vaccine. So the polysaccharide vaccine is VI based, VI antigen based, and, and because it's a polysaccharide vaccine, the immunological memory is less. So maybe not that effective in younger children. So about five years you can give it. It was available some time back. And the uh, other vaccine is a O antigen vaccine, uh, which is in a capsular form, can be even oral or in a liquid way. So in a younger child also, you can give this. So even for travel, and those are the types of vaccines that were available, but no longer we can get those vaccines in our country at the moment. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, we can... Have some. Uh, we can have some questions online or yes. Uh, I am Dr. Shamitul Sanak from the Castle Street Hospital as physician. This is regarding typhoid in pregnancy. 
uh, these days there are so many pregnant mothers coming with fever and diarrhea uh, it may be due to respiratory tract infection and so on and uh, it's extremely difficult to find abdominal uh, examination and the diagnosis with this uh, the with the fetus so uh, now is there any special recommendation in pregnancy or that uh, we are sending the blood cultures and uh, do you ask to start with ivkf tracks on straight away or oh, and the other concern is that i have to admit all these patient to the obs wards and uh, so there's a overflowing of the obs wards and also and the other patients are having concerns typhoid stomach and kidney with the with the they need to take extra precautions and uh, so these are practical consequences that we are waiting yes now let me finish and then uh, who is admitted to a ward with the um, suspect of um, typhoid we need to um, implement uh, contact precautions so even for the pregnant mothers if you have if you can uh, find a isolation room or something like that or else you can put the patient to a corner and uh, the food item should not be shared now it's a custom in our country uh, and also uh, hand hygiene is very important as sujatha mentioned we must we must see with the the soap and water is available in the washroom sometimes it's not available and ask them to wash hands frequently and as well as wash hands after using toilet each and every time and also before having a meals so that is very important and nursing staff also should wash hands after attending to that patient because they their hands may be a carrier from one patient to the other so that is uh, that thing uh, keftraxone yes we have now if, if you suspect typhoid we must not wait uh, without uh, starting antibiotics so stool cultures blood cultures normal things you can do yeah. and uh, start antibiotic because in pregnancy it's a immunocompromised state so they can develop uh, complications more than the other thank you there's another question uh, submitted online uh, can we use amoxicillin or ampicillin if keftraxone is not available? Uh, yes, the percent uh, one is sensitive to amoxicillin or ampicillin. Uh, if the patient needs IV, it has to be IV ampicillin. If the patient is very ill, it's always better to go for IV antibiotics, IV ampicillin, or, or uh, if available, keftraxone uh, or, or keftraxone. Any more questions? The dose of, the dose of uh, keftraxone, can we confirm that it's uh, 2 gram IVBD rather than 1 gram IVBD as in other people? 2 gram daily. So the dose, uh, recommended dose of keftraxone, adult dose of keftraxone is 2 gram IV daily. Suspecting salmonella meningitis and deep seated infections, you can increase the risk. Otherwise, for normal typhoid, the two grams will. Also, you can add uh, uh, now, there are drugs like uh, acetromycin, uh, menopenum to treat further um, drug resistant. But fortunately, our uh, this uh, isolate is uh, the, the current outbreak. The isolates are very sensitive, so you don't have to go for those antibiotics. Yeah. Regarding antibiotic sensitivity, now so far uh, throughout uh, this period, uh, we haven't seen much uh, resistant isolates. All the isolates are, all the salmonella isolates are. Uh, almost 100% resistant to ciprofloxacin. That's the first message. And the second is, all are sensitive to ampicillin for uh, chloramphenicol, ketriaxone. Uh, so it is, uh, citromycin is there, but there are the like the basic drugs we are having. And we had, yeah, potramaxol also 100% sensitive. We had the one case of XDR in 2017. Uh, came from uh, Jaffna. That was the only isolate we had uh, XDR or the uh, multiple resistance. So I don't think, uh, and meropenem, yes, uh, according to literature, meropenem is not a very good drug for typhoid. 
in case uh, if, if there is no option, yes, but it's not a very good draft. Thank you very much. I think uh, the discussion went on much longer than expected. Um, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Malika Kapurapadna, Dr. Kosar Kapurapadna, and uh, Dr. Sujata Patragi and Dr. Hatshadatish Chandra for contributing as resource personnel to this important discussion. And uh, for all of you to, uh, I, I mean, we'd like to thank all of you for joining physically and online. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the initially the, the online numbers are restricted to 100, so I understand some could not join. We will uh, put it uh, put the this as a, a video, or so later even later others can uh, watch. And so once again, on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, I thank you everybody for joining and listening to this. Uh, so once again, it is important that uh, typhoid fever is there, so don't miss it. Thank you. As uh, customary, we give uh, a certificate to resource personnel. May I ask uh, Dr. Malika uh, to present a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Kosar Karnavati. And uh, Dr. Sujata Patiraki. Dr. Harsh is at this time. And uh, I have the pleasure of uh, presenting the certificate of appreciation, Dr. Malika Karwadi.